So I don't know uh, if any of you have ever heard or have heard yourself say that you can't be creative or that you don't have time to be creative. And I, I think we all have because I think we as a culture and a society kind of really reward ourselves for, um, for achieving and accomplishing said outcomes. That we set goals and then we meet those goals. And that that's really something that if you're meant to get something done and you get busy doing that, that really being creative sometimes takes back seat. And what I really want to talk about today is that how we really need to flip that. Because when we set and go after specific outcomes, we're really actually narrowing and saying that we already know what the future is. And that if we step back and we, are, we engage in creative kind of endeavors, that we really open this up. And so I'm going to tell you, like, give a little bit of an option, the story of uh, how I feel about that. Um, I was a person who was very goal-oriented, and I wanted to get things done. I wanted to get things done that needed to get done. And uh, I was at a conference, or I, I was working on a big project. It was going really well. Um, we were about to launch it at a conference, and I thought, well, I'm going to treat myself. And because I'm a big dork, I uh, didn't take myself to a spa. I didn't get a pedicure. I um, decided to sign up for a workshop at the conference that wasn't related to my job. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 so I signed up for um, so I signed up for an Arduino uh, microcontroller build session, which is a basically a maker session. And uh, we learned how to take these little computers here, these open source computers called Arduinos, and make them flashlights and use sensors to make them flashlights. And this was quite a moment. Who would think that an LED could make such a big difference? And, um, but it really did. And it just really inspired me. It inspired me to make things. But it didn't inspire me to make things that made sense. I wasn't inspired to make of you know, a mount for my iPhone, or I wasn't inspired to fix the little part in my car that's still broken. Uh, this is 2011. Um, I was inspired to make kind of ri ridiculous things, and I went for it. So, you know, I was inspired to make things like a ball drop, a marble ball drop from um, thrift store game parts and uh, many trips to uh, Radio Shack so that it would sing Auld Lang Syne and drop balls and, um, and flash 2012. I was inspired to make a dress that uh, when I got tweeted it would sing bird songs and flap its wings <laughs> because, because I wanted to bring the excitement of whenever I get a tweet I get so excited and I wanted to bring that out into the physical world. This literally, outside of work, took about every moment for four months of my life, and it was wonderful. Um, a friend loaned me a 3D printer and, um, and basically just played with that. So this is glowy-eyed Liz here. Um, <laughs> and uh, once again, on a New Year's Eve, I was uh, inspired to spend all night obsessing over making a peace crane that you could put together in parts on the 3D printer and modeling after I'd spent all of that winter break playing with this uh, 3D printer. So in order to do this, though, it really needed a lot of help. So and that's one of the key features of the maker movement is that um, everyone likes to share things. And you share, and you collaborate, and you help each other. And so the first person I looked to, because of course I didn't know how to do any of these things. I didn't know how to make 2012 come up on, LED, on those seven segment LEDs. I didn't know how to make it sing Auld Lang Syne. And I didn't know how to design a dress. I didn't know how to make Twitter communicate with it. So I needed a lot of help. And that's part of what's really exciting about this. Is, and first, I went to uh, my dad when I was young, uh, made these things. These are vote meters, <laughs> if you don't know. And uh, so he had a lot of computer, uh, make your own computer, Heathkit electronics. Anyone remember Heathkit? Yeah! So he had those around. So you know, then I could go to him and get a crash course of electronics um, now that I'm a little older than 12. Um, and so, and re-engage this relationship. And he brought out his old, um, his old equipment to kind of teach me, and we put it with the Arduino. And then this is my uh, Facebook friend cluster network graph. And this is another thing that 
as I reached out or, and just asked, like, how do, how do you do things, or shared what the projects were, that different people would get involved, and it would turn these social networks into richer conversations and richer networks and find out what other people are doing, and it really just grew these relationships. So, you know, I want to kind of give these projects a name so that we can talk about them because they really did um, affect me in some meaningful ways. And I'm going to call them WTF projects. <laughs> what the heck projects, you know? <laughs> they have no reason to do it, but it's dedicating real time, you know, real time kind of thing. And of course I learned something from doing these projects because I didn't know how to do these things. So I learned something, but it was so much more than learning something. I had more ideas, I had better ideas, creative ideas came to me more often. And I know that from talking to a few of you in this room, this has happened to other people that have kind of taken on these kind of maker projects or some, a ridiculous project and then it makes you think differently. I was approaching work more uh, differently, more effectively, more ideas, more confident in my ideas. I had professional colleagues come up to me and say that they thought that I had transformed over the last few months. They didn't know that I was obsessing over this at home. Um, so I think uh, I, it was as though I had become supercharged. You know, things were just coming all the time. And I had engaged some kind of through the passion of this making and through exploring it and exploring it with my networks, I had engaged some kind of superpowers inside of me. So what's going on here? As I asserted in the beginning, I really think that we don't, we don't as a society give enough time to these kind of meaningless projects where we don't know what the outcome is, where we don't know why we're doing them, that we just are pursuing them. And that we really, when we're just focused on the goal-oriented ones, we have a narrow viewpoint. And that these, when we open it up, we're actually giving a new viewpoint on our own reality, which makes us make new realities and really see things in fantastical ways. And we all have this in us. We can all be creative and we can all kind of look at new realities and we actually have to, to solve real world problems. I looked at the ideas of design thinking to kind of support and think kind of this through. Uh, this is David Kelly, uh, co-founder of IDEO. And he just came out with a book called Creative Confidence. And it really, he talks about how we often think of Creative, being a creative person or not being a creative person. That is a false dichotomy. But that really, it's something that we can learn just like anything else through a series of th small steps to get there. So what I want to do is kind of br bridge this over to, the, to kind of this maker activity and that what David Kelly and Creative Confidence is talking about is really pairs well with maker activities and doing these WTF projects. And one of the reasons is, is because maker, the maker movement is really into WTF projects. <laughs> you know, if you go to a maker fair, it's perfectly acceptable to see a cupcake bicycle. Um, you know, it's perfectly fine for a unicorn to flame. Why not? <laughs> or, you know, a decapitated head of a, met, a metro, Metropolitan Museum of Art sculpture to be modified and 3D printed. So that's one reason, because it's acceptable to do these projects that aren't specifically doing something. But also, they're iterative, so it's something what, with that creative confident, uh, confidence, it's iterative, so we can get at it by piece by piece, little by little. It's collaborative, we can draw on a network, because a lot of this is open. It's okay to copy what's out there, what other people are doing, and work together. So it's really a great gateway into building this creative confidence. And uh, this is uh, Massimo Banzi, who was, is the uh, co-founder of Arduino, that little computer that I showed you blinking lights at the beginning. And I love his thought that it's open sourcing imagination because we're all collectively accessing this together. He, he calls it at, that it's shared knowledge that um, encapsulates complexity so that everyone can access it. And what he's saying is, is that as we build up this together collaboratively, that I can access it online and through my networks, and then I as a non-specialist, I as someone that you know, is not an electrical engineer, 
can get in there and kind of do something and that I can empower myself through doing that. Um, and this is what can lead us to fabulation, inventing fabulation, which I thought I invented the word for a few minutes, <laughs> and then Google told me it already had a dictionary definition. You know, I thought it, <laughs> Google, <laughs> always ruining the fun. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I was thinking, oh, digital fabrication of the fabulous from the imagination. What it really means is the construction of fables and stories, usually with a heavy element of fantasy. <laughs> but that works, because it does, it does. So stick with me here. Um, because this is really about if we open our ideas using this unimaginable creativity and that nothing is impossible, that it's really about rewriting our own stories individually and collectively and having unimaginable options. So, I'm uh, going you know, look at the writing of Neil, Neil Gaiman here and how he says we all have the obligation to daydream. We all have the obligation to imagine and that that's how we'll see the world differently and that's how we're ultimately going to change the world. And this is a great, um, this is a great presentation by a design firm in uh, India, Superflux, who talks about fairy stories for the 21st century, that how important it is for us with all these world problems to really take a new look through the eyes of fantasy, through fairy stories, at the world, so that we can not like linearly progress, but really create this disruptive force through our creativity. So I know that I've taken us from LED lights to the supernatural. <laughs> But it's really in, in this idea that we, um, that we can activate ourselves. And this is, a, um, this is a project from the Art Institute of Chicago where with our Impressionism and Fashion show, we um, had kids, uh, teens, uh, envision how identity and fashion would look in the future. And she made not, used an Arduino and made this beautiful hat that reads minds. So, <laughs> so it wasn't really a WTF project because we did assign it. But that gave me the idea that basically I'm giving you all TEDx homework <laughs> that uh, to really actually um, have a crazy idea, make something, something that doesn't have a WTF project, try and activate your superpowers. See if you can, if it changes you. And uh, be part of the conversation um, if you want to, WTF project, be part of the network, and um, let's do it together. Thank you.